founder of OpSafe International, Psychological First Aid for Children. And today I'd like to talk with you about safety in OpSafe camps for children. So there are two things that we are most concerned about. The first is that the children that are under our care are safe, that they will not experience more trauma or any kind of physical, verbal, or mental abuse while they're in our care. The second portion is keeping our volunteers and our staff safe. As we work with children who have experienced PTSD or post-traumatic stress, we want to make sure that we are handling the stress that we receive from them in a safe manner. Now let's talk first about child protection standards. In 2004, the tsunami that came through Asia, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and Thailand, there was a massive effort to bring help to these countries. And part of that effort was a understanding of post-traumatic stress with children. However, not all of the interventions that were attempted in the response to the Asian tsunami were beneficial. And so here we have some guidelines that were developed after the Asian tsunami. And let me quote, nearly all children and adolescents who have experienced catastrophic situations will initially display symptoms of psychological distress, including intrusive flashbacks of the stress event, nightmares, withdrawal, inability to concentrate, and others. And we have seen this over and over again as we've responded to trauma, traumatic events in Asia, uh, Japan, China, the Philippines, Indonesia, and then also in Haiti, that children who are exposed to these traumatic events will develop symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And this is very normal. This is a normal reaction to an abnormal event. However, that does not mean that all children need therapy or need a traumatic stress intervention. So we want to be careful about the way that we do things. Now, all children need emotional and spiritual care following trauma, but not all children will need counseling or professional help. And, and this is just common sense when you think about it. If we can apply first aid, if we can give them comfort and care, we actually can prevent them from needing counseling or therapy. So we want to be careful as we rush in to help communities that have gone through disaster that we don't diagnose a child as having PTSD because they have nightmares or because uh, they are uh, developing some symptoms. Most children will have symptoms. That does not mean that they will develop PTSD. In fact, our goal is that they will not develop PTSD because we'll provide them with the care that they need. Most children and adults will gain normal functioning once basic survival needs are met. And, and this is the most important, security and safety have returned and developmental opportunities are restored within the social, family, and community context. What this means is that once that support structure, family, the church, the school, the community, has stabilized and they're able to support and encourage the children, most children will bounce back. In fact, we have noticed that about 80% of the children in a community will be fine. However, 20% of the children will need a little extra care. Now the problem, of course, is 
How do you find those 20%? How do you tell who needs the care and who doesn't? And so what we do with OpSafe is we come in and provide the care for all of the children. Not therapy, not counseling, but care. And as we care for these children, we're able to ensure that they all get the help that they need. Now, out of the 20% that need care, there's usually 1% that needs professional care. And they are the ones that go on to develop PTSD. Many times these children are actually suffering from trauma that is underlying or previous to the disaster. When a disaster happens, such as an earthquake, we discover things that weren't visible before. For example, maybe a, a school or a house was poorly constructed and the contractor cheated and used substandard materials. And in normal times, you would look and see, oh, this place is great. There's no problem. This is a, a strong house. But then when the earthquake comes, the house falls down. And you realize that it wasn't what it appeared to be. Now, this same thing can happen in families and with children. From the outside, we look and we think, oh, this is a great family. These children are, are healthy and well. But then, when a disaster comes through, we can discover that this child had been abused. This child had been exploited. And the disaster exposes the evil that's there. In the island of Samar, after Typhoon Yolanda, we discovered 30 children who were in need of rescue because they were being abused or exploited. And the only reason that we were able to discover this need was because the children told us. They told us because they finally had someone around them who listened, who valued what they said, who they felt safe with. So child protection means that we listen and we care for children and we're aware that sometimes things aren't exactly what they seem. We don't want to take every child through counseling or therapy. It's not necessary. But we want to make sure that every child is cared for. Some children require more specialized interventions. Immediately after traumatic events, activities and opportunities which allow children to talk about or otherwise express painful experiences and feelings, such as physical and artistic expression, are most beneficial if facilitated by people the children know and trust and have continued contact with. One problem with interventions, uh, psychological interventions, is that oftentimes it's conducted by outsiders. And, and this might be a mental health worker, a social worker, a psychologist, uh, but they're coming in from Manila or the United States. And after a short time together with the children in that disaster hit area, they must then return back. And what experts have found is that this actually can become detrimental because uh, the child has finally found someone that will listen to them, who will uh, appreciate and value what they're saying. And then, as that relationship has been established, it's suddenly torn away from them again. And so, with OpSafe, our primary focus is to enable and equip the local church so that they become the person who the relationship is built with. And that way, a child who experiences disaster, they are comforted and cared for by the local church, and then later on in life, as they experience other small traumas, personal traumas, 
they have someone to go to. And they can go back to that local church and receive care in an ongoing manner. So uh, we want to avoid bringing in outside groups of people on uh, disaster relief trips. Instead, to encourage and equip the local church to be there for the children in their community. Trauma counseling should not be the point of departure for psychosocial programming. Uh, and in the past, psychological debriefing, especially for adults, has included a time of breaking down defenses. And so the idea was to get people to open up and share what they experienced. And then as they shared that, uh, the body could start healing it. And this method has uh, actually now been largely abandoned. And it really was a method that was focused on adults. So in Operation Safe, we actually don't talk about the child's trauma. Instead, we have introduced some very delightful, wonderful characters a little penguin named Pete, a walrus named Wally, and a seal named Sally. And these cute characters go through their own disaster. And as the children listen to the story and hear about their adventures, they're able to start processing their own trauma and what they went through. And so we talk about things like uh, were you ever alone? How did it feel? How did it feel when you came back together with friends? And as we go through, we're talking about the penguin, but in reality, the children are processing their own traumatic material. But we're not talking about them specifically, and we're not breaking down defenses. We did, we're we're approaching trauma at a child's level. So we bring in characters and then we support that with games and crafts and songs. And over and over again, as we've conducted these camps in, in places like Tibet, in Nepal, Philippines, the Haiti, the children have told us, this is the most fun I've ever had. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a trauma camp, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and yet the children are having a great time. And that's exactly what they need. I was in China after the Sichuan quake, and we did our first camp. And after the camp, I talked with the, the principal of the school, and I, and I asked him, I was very concerned, um, did did the camp work? I, I didn't know. <laughs> Would this work or not? And so I asked him, did it work? And, and he brought his six-year-old daughter out from behind him. And he said, this is my daughter. After the earthquake, she didn't talk. She didn't smile. She didn't laugh. She didn't play. But after your camp, I have my daughter back. I was, I was touched, and I was more convinced than ever, this is what we have to do. You see, when a child goes through a traumatic experience, oftentimes it's like pushing the pause button on the, the video you're playing. It's, it's like you paused their life, and they, they look to adults for cues. And they see the adults are stressed out. The adults are afraid. The adults are worried. And so they freeze. When we hold a camp for children, it gives them permission to be children again. It's OK to laugh. It's OK to play. It's okay to have fun. And 
The children have the play button pushed once more on their life. So we, as the adults, need to help children understand that they are now in a safe place. It's okay to be a child. It's okay to go back to normal. And part of that responsibility is we need to make sure that we are keeping the children safe while they're in our care. So we have a child protection policy that we hold to. Uh, number one is child abuse. And we want to make sure that all of the local church people, the volunteers that we train, are trained in what is child abuse. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, exploitation, or neglect. So that they are not committing child abuse and also that they are able to recognize the signs of child abuse. Once again, disasters oftentimes will expose the evil that is hidden in our midst. So we want to prevent any abuse that might happen during our camps uh, and this is accomplished through recruitment and selection. We recruit primarily through the local church. We want to make sure that these are not outsiders coming into the community where they might abuse children, but these are insiders, people that the local pastor and the local community know well. We have a code of conduct, and we make sure that each of our volunteers signs off on the code of conduct and that they understand the code of conduct. And this code of conduct is based off of uh, a very wonderful and well-written code of conduct uh, produced by Tear Fund. Uh, and then we want to be careful about communications regarding children. And so uh, we're not sharing information about the children that could be used by elements that would try to exploit them. All right. So in the next section, I'd like to talk about team care and self-care and how you keep yourself and your team from developing secondary post-traumatic stress disorder. Thank you very much. I'm Jonathan Wilson with Operation Safe, OpSafe International.